Well, thanks everyone for taking some time to join us here today. Um, I know you all have been uh, hard at work in your own capacities. Uh, the committee members, um, you know, formulating a report that was released this week, which has some really good concrete recommendations for the state of the steps we need to take to be prepared for the fall's elections. Um, so I appreciate that we're joined by Brad Cook, who chaired that committee, the 2020 Emergency Election Support Committee. Uh, it's also chair of the Ballot Law Commission in New Hampshire. Uh, we also have State Senator Tom Sherman, um, who's a member of the Election Law and Municipal Affairs Committee and was a member of that um, uh, election preparedness committee as well. Matt Norman, who's the city clerk in Manchester, obviously, and Kate Hanna, who's an attorney and was also a member of the Emergency Election Support Committee. Thank you for all spending a few moments with us today. Um, this question comes up a lot. I think uh, folks around New Hampshire are really concerned about what the future holds for us in September and November. Um, they're seeing um, experiences in other states, uh, such as Wisconsin and most recently in Georgia this week, of um, election officials perhaps not being prepared uh, for the crush of folks that seek to uh, vote by absentee ballot um, and ensuring that folks can, if they choose, to safely uh, show up in person and be able to cast a ballot. Uh, we know that um, our Secretary of State has uh, estimated, and you could probably shed additional light on the number of folks that might take advantage of the opportunity to vote by absentee ballot. Uh, because of the pandemic, he said uh, perhaps 50% of voters might choose that option. We know that it's typically, I think, in the 8 to 10% range. So that involves a significant scaling up of that effort uh, to make sure folks can take advantage of it. And the other considerations as well, making sure our poll workers are safe, uh, that voters who are showing up in person um, are protected and that we're not um, facilitating the spread of COVID-19 is critically important. Uh, we've got to make sure that everyone can safely uh, cast their ballot in the September primary and the November general election, which we know there's a lot of interest in and expect that turnout uh, will be quite significant. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to you first, Brad. You chaired uh, the committee. Um, could you walk us through some of the findings of the report um, and what the next steps are for our state and local officials to uh, be prepared for what's ahead. Sure. Thank you, Congressman. Um, you're right. In um, April, the Secretary of State uh, established this committee, which he did not have to do, to advise him on the expenditure of federal funds that you all appropriated as part of the CARES Act to help states with uh, election-related matters that arise because of COVID-19. Um, and in doing so, we had to peel back the, as I've said many times, the layers of the onion because you have to figure out what the election process is like before you know how to address the fact um, that you got to spend some money on it. So we spent a long time, many sessions, um, many hours, inviting anybody who wanted to talk to, to give us their input. Uh, and then we came up with a report which was submitted to the Secretary of State on uh, Monday. Uh, the six members of the committee, some knew each other. Um, Kate and I are law partners, so we ostensibly knew each other. Um, I had not met um, Kathy Siever or Tom Sherman, and it was a delight to do so, and we're incredibly lucky. Uh, a plug for Senator Sherman, but we're incredibly lucky that he's taking his time to serve the public because it was a real pleasure. Uh, when we were done, uh, we came up with a number of kinds of recommendations. One, obviously, was recommendations on the priorities for spending the money. And the priorities were, and, and they had to be divided between what we expect to be a lot more uh, absentee ballots. One of our findings was the safest way to vote this year is to vote absentee uh, because then you don't have to go out and you're not crowding a polling place. So therefore, you're not endangering other people from the public and you're not endangering poll workers. Um, so the increased number of absentee ballots and the processing of them was one of our recommendations. One of our recommendations was uh, PPE equipment for poll workers and for voters, because if a voter shows up at the polls without the proper equipment, it has to be available for them. And Senator Sherman's an expert on that, and he can fill us in more detail than that. We talked about uh, publicity, but, uh, telling the public about what's available and how to do it. Um, and that included a hotline at the Secretary of State's office 
um, a statewide every household mailing, uh, and then a section on free publicity, like what we're doing right now. Uh, we expect this will get a lot of free publicity from people running for office, like yourself, uh, and the political parties, because they want they want the people to vote. They want them to vote safely, but also uh, colleges for their students, um, businesses for their employees, the press. Um, I was on the exchange this morning and plug in for this. Um, and then we talked about um, postage. We be, we got to be much more expert in terms of the U.S. Postal Service and its rates than we ever thought we wanted to be. Uh, Senator Sherman, again, is the, uh, became an expert on that subject. If he, if he doesn't go well in the medical business, he can become a postmaster. Um, the, uh, um, so we had a whole bunch of them. Now the problem is, uh, and, and additional aid to the cities and towns in doing their increased work. And how do you handle all these ballots? Uh, how do you count them? Uh, how do you count them if you're a town that's a uh, non-machine town? How do you count them if you're a big city like Matt runs? Um, how many machines do you need? Do extra machines have to be there to count the absentee ballots while you're counting the in-person ballots? And I think, um, summing it up, that uh, we probably recommended things that if they were fully funded would be a heck of a lot more than $3.2 million. So the Secretary of State has to take that, apply it to the conditions on the ground as it goes forward, working with the clerks uh, to see where we are, order the right equipment and proceed. So it's, it's uh, these are recommendations to him. We didn't have any authority other than what he asked us to do. We didn't make recommendations on what elections ought to look like after 2020 at his request, because I think we probably have different ideas on those subjects, which is fine. Um, but it's, uh, it, was, it was a very interesting thing. And we talked about some non-money things like what should the applications look like? Um, how easy should it be to get an application? What's uh, registering absentee look like? How do you uh, ask for a, one of those uh, packets? And a whole lot of other things. So that's enough for me, but it was, it was a very interesting uh, process. Great, well, thanks for outlining uh, those steps and, and for your work. I'd like to just throw it open to the group and hopefully we can have a free, free flowing conversation here. Um, Kate, I don't know if you have anything to add to build on that. Um, you know, what are we looking at for next steps? Uh, I know some um, of these provisions are going to require a, a legislative change uh, to ex execute. Some are going to require funding. Um, you know, as we see this process move forward, um, uh, what are what are the marks New Hampshire needs to hit to be, um, you know, taking up and implementing these these provisions? Thank you, Congressman. Um, first of all, I want to say it was a great pleasure to be a part of this committee. And uh, one of the hallmarks of the committee was that it really acted in a nonpartisan way to allow all New Hampshire citizens to vote safely in the fall elections. I'm going to leave, if you don't mind, to Senator Sherman, the legislative end of this, um, and some of the uh, things that we need to accomplish in order to make slight changes in the laws to allow for the committee's recommendations. Um, what I'd like to emphasize is for next steps is education, education of the New Hampshire citizens about this new regime for the fall elections. Um, it's incumbent on all of us to get the word out to uh, nursing homes and students and citizens everywhere about how to both register absentee to vote and also to vote absentee. We had some pretty compelling evidence from Matt Normand um, during our committee meetings about the, I think you said, Matt, 10,000 um, same day registrants at one point in Manchester. And that uh, portrays the problem that we're about to face in the fall of having very clogged up polling places, which we love. We love people to get out and, pull and vote. But this time around during COVID, it's a real risk to have that kind of lining up of people and congestion. So our committee is very much hoping that we get the word out to 
um, all citizens that it, they should start now thinking about registering to vote by absentee, which is the first time in New Hampshire that this is going to be done very easily and seamlessly, and also to get their absentee ballot. Um, and we believe that that is the safest way that we can promote um, voting in the fall. That's great. Well, since you mentioned Senator Sherman, maybe we'll turn it over to you um, in terms of uh, you know those legislative remedies that uh, you might be hoping to push as a result of the committee's work. I know we saw how difficult it was yesterday in Durham uh, to suspend the rules and even uh, pass bills that have bipartisan overwhelming support. Um, so are there things that the legislature needs to do and uh, how confident are you that we uh, can get those over the finish line in an appropriate time frame? Yeah, uh, well, thank you, Chris, for inviting me. And it's uh, wonderful, as, as Brad was saying, it's a little bit of a mini reunion being back together again. Uh, I didn't know, except for Kate, I really didn't know anyone else on the committee. And uh, it was just a, a wonderful experience. Um, a lot of work was done by a lot of people, both during the uh, time we were together, but also behind the scenes with subcommittees and otherwise, uh, and uh, things that I never thought I would learn a lot about, I became a mini expert on. <laughs> so I think all of us did, and uh, you know the work uh, that Gene Van Loan did on pulling uh, some of the really difficult, nuanced ideas together towards the end was was spectacular. But uh, you know the fundamental. Uh, driver of all the work we're doing is that in New Hampshire, we absolutely pride ourselves on secure, robust turnout. I mean, our elections are secure, the, ro the turnout is robust, and people really participate. I mean, we saw that in the presidential primaries, we've seen that in the long history of New Hampshire, uh, New Hampshire elections. So how do you do it? How do you shift all of that from less than 10% absentee to saying, well, the, the safest way to vote in 2020 is absentee. So were we to be super successful, we'd be looking at 80 plus percent absentee voting. Um, and that's a massive undertaking. Um, and what we discovered were there were areas where it's not so easy for the voter to actually access, like absentee registration. That exists already. But it's, it takes some real jumping some hurdles to get to, through that process. Uh, so one of the major uh, focus, uh, foci of this, uh, of our recommendations was how do we make one, how do we bring this to everybody's attention? How do we make it much easier to do, not less secure, but much easier? And, um, and some of the ideas like an every household mailing, which hopefully will be undertaken, these are things that don't require statute. But if you look at the report, there, are, there were probably 11 or so recommendations that would either require a change in statute or, a, um, or an executive order. And it's a little bit difficult to handle elections with an executive order because that in itself is, is a tough spot for any governor to be in, where you're actually doing executive orders about a process that gets you elected. <laughs> so so the, going through the legislature is going to be pretty important for these efforts and having a 2020 only package of, of um, statutory changes that sunset at the end of 2020 is one of the things that uh, I've now picked up as we've come out with our recommendations. Yesterday I met for well over an hour and a half with the uh, Secretary of State and his deputy to call this down. We're at about six now um, and we are going to be putting those into a package with the input of Republicans and Democrats and experts um, to make sure we are fitting them in appropriately, the Attorney General's office will need to be involved to support some of these temporary changes that again, 
increase accessibility, increase ease of access to both absentee uh, registration and absentee ballots, but absolutely do not impact security, which I think is a reasonable concern. So, um, and one of the major, I guess one of the major reasons I was asked to be on this is because one, I'm, I'm vice chair of Senate election law, but I'm also a physician, as you know. And so being able to bring some of that healthcare and PPE expertise to this and making sure the poll workers feel safe and are safe, uh, both leading up to election day and processing absentee materials, but also on election day, interacting directly with uh, the voters is paramount because they are, they are the key to a successful uh, election is having everybody who's working, you know, many of them are volunteers and many of them are older like me um, and may have other medical issues and they don't want to be exposed unnecessarily, but they are absolutely dedicated to the process. So making that, re reassuring them that they can do this and they can do it safely and that safe processes are in place was a high priority. All of this, whatever needs to be covered in temporary statute for this election only is, is now my focus uh, as the Secretary of State uh, moves forward. And one of the uh, really wonderful parts of all this is, and I think uh, Brad and Kate will agree with me, we are already seeing changes in the website. We're seeing changes in the information being put out. We're seeing a response that's already being implemented even before we came out with our report. So um, all positive. Uh, I think Georgia was a great uh, example of what we want to avoid. And, um, and the wonderful part of this is, is that it's bipartisan or nonpartisan. It is an uh, all hands on deck effort to get out the word, which is why today is so important because if people are going to vote in this election and they wanna vote safely, they wanna not put our volunteers and our election workers at risk, by far the safest way to do that is absentee. Well, thanks for your work. And Matt, uh, Matt Norman, I can see you're at City Hall, not in your home office. Uh, but we appreciate everything you do. You pull off at least two elections a year in Manchester. It's typically a pretty well-oiled machine, even for high turnout events. Uh, you have a cadre of volunteers and ballot inspectors and ward officials uh, that help uh, with the election day work. Um, I'm wondering um, how you're feeling about uh, September and November, uh, what steps you're already trying to take and um, you know, what you think you need to make sure that you can effectively ramp up, especially the absentee uh, voting and registration uh, to meet the demand. Well, thank you, uh, Congressman, for the invitation today. Appreciate, we uh, certainly appreciate the ability to at least get our thoughts uh, across and, and uh, Brad's committee um, has been great. Uh, and, and taking in a lot of the comments from, from my colleagues um, and sharing their concerns. Uh, I think what keeps us in Manchester awake uh, most nights is, is, number one, is the staffing at the polls. So we have 260 um, volunteers, election officials working the polls. There's 12 wards in Manchester, as you know, and um, our it's really our, our primary concern at the moment is are we going to, many of those uh, election officials are older and I'm sure um, concerned about their safety at the polls, uh, just working. So um, that's really being able to staff the polls, number one, is our primary concern uh, right out of the gate. Um, and then in the office as well, we, as has been talked about, and I think it's, it's a reasonable uh, estimation that we could have 50% uh, absentee participation. And, you know, in Manchester and some of the larger cities, that's a big undertaking. Um, we, our, our run rate typically on a, on a presidential election is about 4,500 absentees um, for the city. 
you know, it, uh, with a 51,000, 52,000 ballots cast on election day. So, you know, it doesn't take that simple math to, to figure out we're going to get buried in absentees. So uh, 25, 20 to 25,000 absentees. Um, it takes us currently with pre-COVID uh, to handle 4,500. We're working six days a week as we get down to, this, uh, to the election, probably the last two or three, just processing those as they come in and getting them ready for the polls for distribution. I'm honestly not sure how we, we're going to be able to do that without staffing up significantly. Um, Congressman's probably aware just locally of uh, some of the challenges we've had in Manchester with our budget. You know, budgets have been um, uh, needed to be trimmed to make up for shortfalls in revenue. So uh, we actually had a, a budget cut on Tuesday night in this office and many other offices across the city. So you know, we're already under a financial strain. And uh, the expectation of trying to staff up is uh, is daunting on, on, on many levels. You know, not just uh, finding people number one that are, are that are able to do the work, but also uh, being able to pay for that. Um, the next issue that we have, and, and many of my colleagues have, is social distancing at the polls. These these polls, um, again, uh, as the local. Uh, Representatives from Manchester here know uh, our polling places, we have 12 locations. Um, they're limited in terms of, of how we can space out within the polling location. So uh, as we spread out and socially distance the staff, um, I think that has a lot to do with what happened in Georgia and, and those lines getting longer and longer, which we don't want to happen. Um, we don't have uh, a statewide solution on electronic checklists. Um, so you, we're stuck with alpha, alpha, alpha lines. Uh, and, you know, those, depending on how people walk into a poll, if your lines get longer, A through F, and then, you know, 30 minutes later, it could be, you know, another, another line that gets backed up. So it's a, it's a juggling act under normal circumstances and under good times um, with the, the, for the election officials that are in the polls. Um, so that's, that's a concern is just the, um, if people, um, you know, obviously we expect a high number of, of absentees, um, that'll take some of the pressure off the polls, but uh, we're almost adding pressure again, as we space people out, we have less opportunity for people to, um, to have bodies in there. We just don't have the footprint within the polls to add, you know, a big long space because we still need to have a, uh, a state law required uh, number of booths in the poll uh, location. Uh, so that's a concern. The PPE, I, I explained when I spoke to Brad's committee, um, you know, that's about 750 units uh, per election in Manchester. Um, and that's just changing, uh, changing that PPE based on our health department's recommendations of once every eight hours. So um, if there's, I noticed in Brad's report, there's some recommendations to actually change it more frequently if somebody feels, you know, that it's been compromised. So um, that was just based on the number of people we have and changing it every eight hours. So twice, twice per day. Um, as Kate mentioned, and, and I think really the biggest thing for, for all of uh, the localities is, is publicity. I mean, you've all mentioned it, and it's a huge piece of this. Uh, it's just collaborative. Is, is everybody collaborating on getting the word out that it's okay to vote absentee, that, that it's the safest way to alternative to vote, voting in the polls? Um, and if there's people that would rather not vote because they're afraid to go to the polls, I mean, we want them to vote absentee and, and getting that word out and making it as easy as possible. Um, but the flip side of that is when those absentees goes, goes to the poll on election day to be processed as the law permits now or requires now, um, you know, that's, if anybody's ever walked in while they're processing absentees, we have one tabulator per, per polling location 
you know, it's a, it's a juggling act of trying to process maybe, you know, 40 or 50, and then the next person in line is live voting is there. It's, it's lines can back up quickly if, if uh, it's, so that's a juggling act in just processing all those. So um, I'll try not to dominate too much of the time here, but the, um, we're, we're, uh, we're trying to, to uh, come up with plans. Our biggest thing right now is to make sure we have staffing available um, at this point um, and just following closely on, on what, um, what the committee has made for recommendations and hopefully what comes out of that. Now, I know, Matt, <clears throat> you're proactive, uh, your office is about um, letting you know, members of the community know how they can register to vote. You uh, do tabling at community events. Um, a lot of that probably isn't going to be happening this summer, but are there still things you can do uh, to, you know, communicate to residents of uh, the sure. city about how they can register uh, early to perhaps avoid and create lines in November? Yeah, so we extend our hours here. So we're uh, Beyond the, the eight to five, we, we're open every Tuesday night till eight o'clock. Uh, we get a lot of traffic for, for actually voter registration during uh, close to the election. Um, you know, part of it is waking people up in the middle in the summer and saying, "Hey, come come register to vote." They're obviously not not always thinking about the election until they get closer to it. Um, we have 22 healthcare facilities, uh, assisted living facilities, nursing homes. Traditionally, we've gone directly to them uh, every election and helped them through the, the absentee voting process. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to work this year in the, in the COVID world. Uh, will we be able to get in there? Uh, will they want us there? Um, and if not, it's educating the um, who, who's ever in charge of the facility on assisting people to vote absentee without our staff there if they, if they don't want us there. So uh, we're certainly willing to go. It's something we do, we've done since I've been city clerk. It's been a priority for us um, to, to deal with all 22 of those facilities. And uh, we'll, we'll continue to do that if we're permitted. Uh, if not, we'll, we'll come up with an alternative to try to uh, train the, uh, the, you know, the uh, managers that are, that are working there on site to, to assist people. Um, community events, I just had a conversation before this meeting with somebody uh, that is part of a Brady Sullivan complex. There's about um, uh, the lofts along the river, Congressman. Um, the, there's about 850 people there. There's a lot of turnover. So I do several events there, just there each year. We're gonna do that again uh, outside in their parking lot. Uh, possibly as early as next week. So uh, we're working on scheduling that. So we're gonna try to pick and choose and, and get into some events or at least uh, in locations that people need to get to us um, in, in the off hours, whether that's on a Saturday or, or after, uh, after work. Somebody, one of the things that Senator Sherman said that I think we should reemphasize, Congressman, is the website that the Secretary of State has is continuously being updated uh, and if people go to nh.sos.gov, they can uh, find a really interesting um, connector, um, whatever you call it, uh, that to click on. And that has all of the things you need to do to do these things remotely, including uh, downloading a request for an absentee ballot, instructions for registering um, uh, remotely, and all kinds of other things. And it's, I sent it out this morning to uh, two um, university presidents and to two CCRC administrators uh, and to a whole lot of other people who, if this uh, link gets spread around, it really is a full service um, operation that people can then in turn uh, distribute to their um, if you're a university president and if your college is coming back in the fall, uh, and that's got both kinds in Manchester, um, that uh, the students, because students jam up polling places when they're trying to register. Um, and if they can do it before that, uh, working with the supervisors of the checklist and the uh, town or city clerks, it'll take a tremendous amount of pressure off. If the nursing home administrators make it available to people so that they don't have to, um, the, the, the 
it's a it's a strange world when you can't go visit people in nursing homes. How long that's going to last, I don't know. But the internet gets the stuff there, and they can administer it uh, internally. So the real key to this thing is to distribute these pieces of information, these links, and these resources, so that people uh, know how to vote. You know, because this is a when you think about what happened in Pennsylvania and Georgia uh, in the last week, that was a primary. That wasn't a general election. This is a presidential year. And it's, it's, and if they could screw that one up, think, think what they'll be able to do in November. So we, in, in the last line of the report, uh, says, you know, the future of the country and the world could, could be changed if we don't get this right forever. And so this, this, you know, isn't just an incidental little play thing. This is, this is serious business, and we've got to get it right. One, one quick comment, uh, Congressman, uh, is that one of the uh, statutory changes would be to allow uh, processing to a certain level of ballots prior to Election Day. Um, we heard loud and clear that that Without that, many of these polling places will be completely overwhelmed if they have to do all the processing on election day. Um, and and so I, the combination of getting the word out, getting people um, to a position where they are doing as much as possible absentee, and it's actually it's been made significantly easier to do that with the uh, website. Um, and then recognizing that the fewer people who actually go to the polls, the safer the, the people who are at the polls will be and the safer the voters will be. But that doesn't mean we want fewer people voting. We want the same robust turnout. We just want it done safely. Now, the forms themselves don't necessarily have a checkbox for a voting absentee because of COVID-19. That's one of the recommendations, Congressman, is that rather than, uh, we heard from both the disabled community that they don't consider it a disability. And we also heard from people saying, I'm not comfortable saying I'm disabled because I'm concerned about COVID. So one of the changes that will be in this, one of the statutory changes would be to allow for a separate checkbox for 2020 only that says, I'm concerned about COVID. That's, in, that's consistent with the governor's uh, executive order or emergency order. It's also, it just moves that out of disability and moves it into a separate concern this election only. And Congressman, if I could just say a word about that, we probably should have started with that premise, which is that this is a new world for the fall elections that the Attorney General's office and Secretary of State's office have issued joint opinions that this time only in 2020, um, in order to vote absentee, one in the past one had to say that she or he was either uh, physically disabled or absent from town. And this time around, uh, they can check that box that Senator Sherman was talking about, that I am concerned that if I go to the polls, uh, I have, I have a fear of contracting um, COVID or that I'm at risk of contracting COVID and therefore I want to vote absentee. And so everyone yeah, yeah. should know that. One of the interesting things, I was looking at the absentee ballot request form today for another reason, and it was changed a number of years ago to say, I'm worried about the ice storm that's coming tomorrow. Well, the ice storm that's coming tomorrow is COVID. So, uh, it's really uh, important and that uh, last week while our committee was still uh, meeting on Thursday the Attorney General and the Secretary of State put out new guidance on uh, absentee registration that included a form that does reference um, COVID so they've recognized the necessity to do that the question uh, on all of these things is our election laws are to be charitable complex and um, not always consistent. And so what can we do legally uh, and what, and because we have to operate within the law. So it's, it's, it, was a, it was a neat trick. The whole thing was kind of fun. Well, we appreciate your work and also you taking some time to join us here today to walk us through the findings and also uh, concerns as we move forward. 
Um, I know we're all going to be paying close attention to this, and um, we think you've laid out a pretty good roadmap uh, for New Hampshire to follow and our Secretary of State to, uh, to begin to implement, and uh, we'll be keeping close tabs on that. But uh, Matt, we'll try to find as many volunteers as we can uh, for you to help uh, run the elections this fall. I know I actually voted absentee for the first time in my life um, last year when I had to be down in Washington and miss the city primary. I showed up in person, I filled out the request form, filled out the ballot right there and handed it in. Do you expect that you'll see um, you know, folks just showing up and completing it um, in person? And what kind of considerations do you have for that? Yeah, so we're, um, we've installed uh, sneeze guards, uh, I guess we're calling them now, um, but we've got glass partitions on our, on our counter here at the office. We have a tremendous amount of activity uh, just under normal circumstances uh, with people walking in and wanting to vote absentee, voting right here and, and being in the process within five to 10 minutes. So um, right. we that pick up and um, we've, we've got our, our floors marked out and spaced out um, so that uh, people know where to stand and, and stay safe while they're in here. And we've had some staff training uh, just this morning on uh, when we when we open, how that's going to work, um, and so we're confident we're going to be able to handle that coming up. Yeah. Well, once again, we thank you all for your work um, and uh, wish you all the best. Hope everyone stays safe. We're going to continue to try to fight for some funding in Washington because we know that uh, that's a critical issue. Matt mentioned already uh, budget cuts that we're seeing at the local level. I think the federal government has a role to play to backstop um, you know, our state and local budgets to make sure that services aren't disrupted, but um, also to recognize that there are increased expenses as a result of COVID uh, to run safe elections. Um, in the CARES Act, uh, you all know that the $3.2 million is coming to New Hampshire for that purpose, but it appears that um, there are gonna be a lot more asks than potentially that pot of money uh, will satisfy. Um, we did pass another bill, uh, the HEROES Act, which would have had about $29.5 million uh, without requiring any sort of local match. Um, that would have given New Hampshire, I think, a, a high degree of discretion of how to use those dollars for, to run safe elections. So I'm hopeful as we see the, um, you know, a bipartisan compromise beginning to come together uh, on the next package that there will be significant funding included. And so uh, stay tuned on that front. But uh, we thank you all for your work and for spending some time with us. We we'll just point everyone, as Brad said, to the Secretary of State's website for up-to-date information on uh, forms and procedures uh, for the upcoming state primary and general election. Uh, and we wish you all well.